Yeah, fairly straightforward, like I said. We're really going to talk about how the nasomaxillary growth takes place. And one thing that it reminded me of when Mark had told me to give this lecture is the first time I did my dental training, uh, which was in India, and then I came back and repeated it in the U.S., I remember thinking, why is all this important? I mean, I want to be a dentist. Why am I learning some of the stuff that I'm learning? And it took me a while to really appreciate why this becomes a cornerstone of what you do. And so I wanted to try and bring out some of the importance, some of the clinical relevance of what we are actually trying to go over today. So when you look at a person, what exactly are you looking at? When you look at these faces, and I just browsed this morning top models, what is it that you're looking at? Are you looking at the eyes, which is a window to the soul? Are you really looking at the teeth and smile? Or are we in fact looking at proportions? Balance. After all, when you look at somebody's face, yes, there's a soft tissue drape. But that soft tissue drape is dependent on where the skeletal components actually are. So it must be a combination of all of them. And yes, we call ourselves dentists, but I prefer the term craniofacial practitioners because we really are the people who understand craniofacial proportions, structure, placement. And I think that's where facial growth comes in. So why, you ask, let's take a look at a patient like this. <coughs> Clearly, there's something not in harmony. Are you all familiar with the term crossbite? Yes, no? <coughs> yes, okay. She has what we would call an anterior crossbite. As you can tell, from the position of the upper and the lower incisors. Something is out of place. Either the maxilla is not in the right place, or maybe the mandible is too big, but something is off. You can take a look at the opposite, where you have a larger than normal overjet, which is really the horizontal relationship between the upper and lower incisors. And while the incisors can compensate for the position of the skeletal components, very often you land up with these kind of disharmonies because of the skeletal base. So what dictates the position of the nasomaxillary complex to begin with? It's the anterior cranial base. And you say, well, how are you so sure that actually the cranium has anything to do with it? If you take syndromic kids, children who are actually born with known genetic deformities, spelling mistakes in their codons, they will result in various different craniofacial anomalies. So here's a child who was born with a condition called Crouzon syndrome, named after a Frenchman who identified it, described it, and today we know that it's actually cranial synostosis that takes place early on that then affects the position of the maxilla. It can have effects on the mandible. The mandible can sometimes try to compensate for the maxilla. The teeth can try and compensate. So you can see how the cranial base actually has a trickle-down effect on the proportions of the face. And certainly, most importantly, for today's lecture on the nasomaxillary complex. So let's take a look at this real quickly. And if you've covered this, I know Anwar said that he already had discussed with you uh, max reposition. Am I correct? To some extent, he had. So I'll try to go over some of this relatively quickly. But if you take a look at the nasomaxillary complex, it's essentially suspended off of the anterior cranial base. And what happens is over time, as the child grows, there is a displacement of the maxilla, the nasomaxillary complex, that takes place downward and forward, which you are all very familiar with. The remodeling or the actual acquisition of growth is taking place posterior superiorly in both those areas right there, as indicated by the arrows. 
And that's what results in the downward position of the maxilla over time. Now this becomes really important, and you'll see why in a minute. But while that is what is happening from a macroscopic picture of the entire nasomaxillary complex, if you just take a look at the maxilla alone, you will see that there are various things going on within the maxilla itself. Not every surface is the same. You will see that the periosteal surface of the oral mucosa, that is the roof of your mouth, is actually depository in nature versus the floor of the nasal cavity is actually resorbing over time. That obviously enlarges the nasal cavity and continues to make the, the maxilla displace or translate downwards. There's an area which is quite critical the maxillary tuberosity, the area behind your distal molars. And that becomes important because that is actually depository in nature back there. And that's the way the arch length increases in the maxilla. That's what allows the orthodontist to actually be able to move teeth distally. So that area becomes very, very critical. And that's why third molars you can take a look at the age and you can make certain determinations and we'll get into that as well when we talk about the clinical applications of this. The lateral wall or the buccal plates are also depository in nature versus the anterior part is actually more resorptory in nature as you can see here. And this is a slide I know that you'll see in every single facial growth class because it's an important concept to understand that even though you can have resorption in one area, the entire volume may be moving in the opposite direction. And I believe both Dr. Hans and Dr. Anwar have covered this as well. Am I correct? Okay. So what actually controls some of these processes? Now obviously as I alluded to in that earlier slide, there's a strong genetic component. But there are also things that, how things actually take place. And Dr. Hans did mention to me that this particular aspect um, is not too highlighted because it does get a little bit more advanced. But just to give you an idea, Sutcher has proposed what he called the sutural hypothesis, and he believed that the suture, that connective tissue between bones, seen in the maxilla, the intramembranous bone, was actually capable of proliferating and expanding out, causing the maxilla to actually move. This theory in labs did not really hold up very well. The next theory that came along was Scott's theory, James Scott in the 1960s. He talked about how in the long bones, you have the epiphysis of the long bones. In the mandible, you have the condyle. And he said, why not the nasal septum? The nasal septum must be the determining character. It must be the most important area that is causing nasal maxillary growth. And so there were a lot of experiments done on that. The issue with that is any time you're going to do experiments, you're going to resect out a piece of the cartilage, and you're disrupting the vascularity, you're disrupting the neurological support. So you're making certain changes that makes it hard to actually interpret that data when it comes to true patients. It still is believed that the nasal septum plays a role. We just don't know exactly how much. <laughs> A very important one that came out from Melvin Moss was that actually soft tissue is what causes it. So form follows function. He believed that as a person grew, bone growth was in response to that. <coughs> the cranial vault would increase in size because the brain was going, the brain was growing. As, as neurological tissue was proliferating, the cranium had to accommodate that. That was his theory. And he believed that as the soft tissue grew, the maxilla had to be displaced. Today, I think it's fairly clear that perhaps a lot of this is true. 
And it's probably a little bit of everything. So why does all this become clinically relevant? How is this important to us? Let's take a look at that very first thing we talked about. How the downward and forward displacement of the maxilla takes place. And ask ourselves, is there something that we can do to actually alter that? As clinicians, that's really the question that you're going to have to figure out. So here's that girl that I talked about. Here's Hallie. She's about 11 years old in this, and you can see that she has a large overjet. The question becomes, can you actually control the downward and forward displacement of the maxilla with some kind of an appliance, prevent it from coming downward and forward, and allow normal mandibular growth to hopefully catch up with the maxilla? Now, several of you have probably gone to orthodontic treatment, and my guess is some of you even are familiar with the term a headgear. Am I correct? Has anybody used a headgear? Okay, so there are a couple here. It's a fantastic device because it really works well. But here she is, prior to treatment, and you can see that I actually think that her incisor position is good, so I'm really going to try and just hold the maxilla in the posterior using a simple headgear device. And the headgear device is basically anchored off the molars and you try and restrict downward and forward displacement of the maxilla. Now remember that maxillary complex is actually attached to the rest of your cranium by virtue of 16 different sutures if I'm not mistaken. And the idea is that if you actually stretch a suture, what happens? What does that tensile strength, what does that tension cause? Anybody familiar with that? It actually induces bone formation. Versus if you compress something, what happens? It actually causes osteoclastic activity. In fact, think about it, that's how we move teeth in orthodontics. A tooth in alveolar bone is essentially connected to bone with the periodontal ligament. It's a suture. It's connective tissue. And so when we apply force on a tooth, one side becomes compressive and the other side becomes stretched or tensile. And that's what induces bone formation or inhibits bone formation and induces osteoclastic activity. So can you control it? You can use a device like this called the headgear, different ways of applying forces to it. And this is her without any lower appliances. And I think you can see that there has been a change in the overjet. Now, I did have upper braces on, so some of that granted was tooth movement. And the only way you can really tell how much change took place is actually to trace it out and measure it. But you can see in this instance, I then go ahead, put the lower braces on, and this is where she finishes up. So we are able to correct her class two malocclusion by virtue of using a head here and moving her teeth over the course of two years. Any questions about what we're talking about? Now, one of the things to keep in mind, yes? <laughs> How young is too young to start doing this stuff? Because you don't let them grow into it. That's a very good question. So when, when, do you, when do you actually start doing this? And I think you, you have to be careful in terms of, A, compliance. You have to make sure that your patient is actually going to be compliant. And second, you want to make sure that the child is still growing. You want to make sure she's still growing? Absolutely. <laughs> you, you're trying to actually take advantage of the fact that you can control the forward and downward displacement of the maxilla. If the person's already done growing, you're stuck with what you have. So on a, in, a, in an instance like this, you absolutely want the person still growing. Because we believe, as craniofacial practitioners, that there are certain areas we can truly make a predictable difference. So if you had an older person that wasn't, uh, like, you know, 45 years old or something like that, and they had that same bite that she had, is there, what could you do? First of all, 45 is really young. <laughs> 
I mean, you have different options at that point. Uh, you know, you could, you could, you can try and do different things. Uh, there's certainly surgical ways of addressing it. There are different ways of addressing it. Um, it's not that you don't have any options, but a headgear would not be your primary choice. Okay. One other thing that I, I, I should mention is that there is a very important part of growth and development, and certainly growth of the nasomaxillary complex. And I'll, next week, when I meet with you on the mandible, we'll review some of that as well. There is what we call a drift of the actual dentition. Some people call it eruption, others call it drift. But what essentially happens is teeth tend to move in three planes. They move occlusally, that's in the vertical dimension, they tend to move vertically. And with tooth movement, what happens? What happens to the alveolus? It actually falls. So as the tooth drifts occlusally, you actually have greater length of the, alveolo of the alveolus. Teeth also tend to move mesially or drift mesially as they erupt. And lastly, they will tend to erupt buckly or move buckly. And in all three planes of space, bone will fall. And that's actually part of the reason why, as the face develops, you will see that typically there will be an increase from infancy to childhood. How, how long does she have to wear that? Um, the appliance? Like, like per day? All, all day? No, I, I'm not that cruel. Uh, mm -hmm. I typically will advise them to wear it for about 12 hours. So I usually will have them wear it at night when they get back from school after their sporting activities. Yeah. By 6.37 it goes in and hopefully it stays in until about 7 in the morning. So you took a look at a situation where we felt that we could actually reasonably predictably at least try to control the downward and forward displacement of the maxilla to result in a good occlusion and a well-balanced face. The question becomes then, can you actually induce the displacement? Like I said, if we can actually stretch the sutures, can we actually induce osteogenic activity? So here's a kid with the opposite situation. Again, you would like to have a growing child in this instance. But you can see the child has a class 3 malocclusion with a hypoplastic maxilla, which means the maxilla is actually retropositioned. And in an instance like this, it's not unusual that you will have what we call the anterior crossbite. And Nick actually also has a posterior crossbite. So what can we do in an instance like this? He's got an issue in the transverse plane or side to side. He has an issue in the AP plane or sagittal plane where the maxilla is hypoplastic. Could he be a candidate for some kind of mechanotherapy? And so we decide to actually make him something called an expander. How many of you have had an expander? A few of you have had that. The way the expander works is very, very simple. There's a suture right in the middle of the maxilla because remember that is a two-part, two-piece bone. And at this age, prior to puberty, that hasn't calcified, it isn't one piece yet. That suture is still wide open. So all we do is place an appliance like this, we can actually turn that jack screw there and widen out the maxilla, stretch the suture, induce osteogenic activity, correct that transverse problem. Again, very simple to do on a child, on an adult, where it's fused, that would require a different type of mechanotherapy. And then you use a reverse face mask instead of using a headgear where we were actually applying pressure posterior superiorly, 
Here you're actually using traction that is distracting or pulling the maxilla anteriorly. And again, this is something that the child wears as much as possible. And realistically, I think getting 12 to 14 hours is probably what you can get. And what that results in is a anterior posterior displacement of the maxilla. And you can control bringing it downward and forward and try to mimic normal displacement of the maxilla. And so here he is following the protraction face mask or the reverse pull of headgear, if you want to call it that, where basically what you've done is try to actually pull the maxilla forward. Was there a question? Are there any questions? Okay. So you've seen how in the anterior posture and in the vertical plane, you can actually use appliances to try and control nasomaxial position. You've also seen that you can influence the transverse by working on the mid palatal suture. What about in the vertical plane? Now remember, the maxilla tends to get displaced in which direction? Down and forward. And what happens to the, what used to be once the floor of the, well, the roof of the mouth, what happens to that? It resorbs, and that becomes part of the part of the nasal cavity. So in this next case that I'm going to point out, that becomes important to you. How many of you have seen a radiograph like this yet? Or know about it? Okay. So this would be called a panoramic radiograph. And just for to run through it with you so that it makes more sense, this is the left side of your patient, this would be the right side. This basically is if your patient was standing there and you were facing them. This is essentially what you would see. And when you're looking at these panoramic radiographs, what I tend to look for is, I look for what teeth are present. So do you see any wisdom teeth? No. Not yet. Unlikely to form. These are the 12 year molars. Those are the first molars. I see two premolars here and here and then I see one tooth here and here. So something might be missing, correct? So two laterals are likely to be missing. I do the same thing with the lower arch, among the other things that I assess. So I take a look at this and I realize it's likely that there, there are two laterals missing. In addition to that, I also find that there's a anterior crossbite. And in addition to the anterior crossbite, I'm also dealing with posterior crossbites. So I have to make a decision how I'm going to treat this case. And I decided, as you probably would, that I'm going to widen out the mid palate suture. That's the first thing I can fix. As I widen that out, what's going to happen? I'm going to actually create more room, too. Then remember, the posterior mic tuberosity is still growing. There's still deposition taking place. If I need to, I can actually afford to move these a tad bit back, maybe even create a little more room. So that's what I start working on. And after a while, her hygiene is an issue, and we decide are we going to take things off. She promises to do better, and we finally manage to get some things resolved, and that's her. I measure things, make sure that she has adequate space for implants, and we go ahead and get her braces off. And we go ahead and we put those Pontex in, and here she is. Should we go ahead with implants? No, until the maxilla stops growing, right? Because otherwise it would shift all over. So he said, not until the maxilla stops growing, because things will shift. What will shift? Everything but the implants. Everything but the implants. So what's going to happen to those implants over time if she's not done growing? The maxilla is going to continue to displace itself downward and forward, right? Can the implants displace themselves? No, they're stuck. So what's going to happen to those implants? And, and superior. And where are they going to land up? 
Theoretically. Yeah, you have them sitting in the nasal cavity, right? That's why it becomes important for you to make sure that maxillary growth is truly complete. Any questions about that? What age is... Well, how, how do you know when they're done again? Very good question. Paul, what's the best way? Ask him. The best way to probably assess... <laughs> just want to make sure he's awake, which I know he is. The best way to actually check and make sure would be to take what we call serial cephalograms. So the x-rays I was showing you of the head, those are called cephalograms. And what we typically do is to take two cephalograms, ideally a year apart, but at a minimum six months apart, and make sure that there are no changes. There's no chronologic age. I have heard people talking about at eight, and if anything, over on the side of caution and wait longer. Yes? Would you be able to predict the growth of a um, maxilla and place it in a little bit of anterior to begin with, so that eventually we catch up in? It's a great question. Prediction of growth. Can we predict maxillary growth? Unfortunately, today, as of today, there is really no accurate enough method for us to say that we can accurately predict the cessation, when the cessation will take place of growth, and therefore where we can place it. Because it depends on how much growth is left, it depends on how fast the growth is going to take place, and it depends on when growth is going to end. And there's really no valid way of doing that at this point. There's a lot of individual variation. Any questions about that? This was the part I was talking about, when there is vertical growth, you will see as eruption takes place, the three planes in which eruption takes place, so drift takes place is occlusal, mesial, and buccal, so remember that. And I believe uh, Nick, who I just met outside before the class, he told me that uh, you're supposed to email uh, me a question or what you got out of the lecture, something like that. So, okay, so I'll give you my email too at the end of this. All right, so remember, as I talked about in the posterior aspect here, what is that surface? Depository or resorptive? Remember how arch length increases? Sorry? Oh, I was pointing to the posterior aspect of your true brosty. That's going to be more depositive. That's how you increase arch length. That's a very important growth area for the maxilla. It's important because if an orthodontist decides to move teeth, or moves, move a molar backwards in the maxilla, he knows he can afford to do it because there's more bone forming in that area. <coughs> that is one way to actually create more room in the upper jaw. One of the things that we as orthodontists face a challenge with is typically trying to figure out where to get space from. If a patient shows up with too much space, that's usually not too much of an issue. It's usually the opposite that we encounter, that is patients showing up with not enough room. And we have to try and figure out where to create that room. In the maxilla, we have these opportunities because of the sutures. We can afford to widen the maxilla. That will create a little more room. Why does it create more room? Well, just imagine the maxilla to be almost like a semicircle. I agree, it's not entirely a semicircle. But if you were to increase the radius of that semicircle by expanding it, what happens to the arch perimeter? It increases. Similarly, if you can afford to actually drive things posteriorly, that creates more room too. So the maxilla is actually much more accommodating to an orthodontist needs for creating more room. And that's why common, commonly you will find very often if teeth have to be taken off for orthodontic purposes, most orthodontists look at the lower arch because the lower arch is where we're limited in our ability to make that decision. So one of the areas that is key is this posture aspect. Does that make sense? Questions for me? Okay. <coughs> 
So the upper jaw is a little more accommodating for, in terms of our needs for space. Why is that so? It's because there are sutures available. So we can actually afford to go ahead and expand the upper jaw. We can split that mid panel suture like I showed you using an expander. That in a sense, just from a geometric perspective, might make it easier to understand. If you widen out the upper jaw, you're increasing the radius of the circle, that gives you more room. But another way of creating more room in the upper jaw is the fact that you have a lot of deposition taking place here and you can afford to actually move things back. If you can move things back, that creates more room in the front. Does that make sense? And that's why if the upper jaw gives you more options, you tend to actually look at the arch which gives you less options. The mandible gives you fewer options. So you actually end up looking at the mandible and seeing if there's too much crowding there, then you're stuck. But if the lower arch, there's not much crowding, you may be able to find room in the upper. Because you can be more creative in the upper arch. I've got a question. Sure. I was just curious from like looking at one of the pictures of uh, girls that like, yeah, the molars still coming in. Yeah. And you obviously needed to create more room, <coughs> but it looked like it was like halfway coming down, so if you're going to be moving the teeth back, aren't you going to disrupt those molars that are trying to come in? And that's a very good question, and actually that's what this segment is about. It's really how much can you afford to move things? Yes, there are biological limits, I mean you can't really afford to push the whole thing back. But the concept, the concept is important that you get, that there is bone back there. Yeah, if you distal drive the whole thing, yes, you can disrupt. Now keep in mind, many times teeth are actually using their adjacent teeth as guides to eruption. And you'll learn this in dental anatomy as well. Like when a Max Ray canine is erupting, have you guys started dental anatomy? Okay, so when Max Ray canines are erupting, what is their guide? They use the Max Ray lateral incisor groups. That's why the Max Ray lateral incisors and central incisors will splay out. Because the canines are putting pressure on the distal aspects of the lateral roots. That's what causes a space in the middle between that age of 9 and 11. So teeth that are erupting tend to use their adjacent teeth as guides. So if you were to distalize the upper molar, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to impact or cause problems to the second molars as long as you're careful in the amount and the speed at which you work. And that's why in a situation like this where you have a 14 year old, you're probably not in a position to make any decisions on those wisdom teeth. Why is it? Why wouldn't you make a decision about extracting the wisdom teeth? Is everything still growing maybe? Because you still have growth, especially in that posture aspect. You know that there is bone getting deposited in this area it's too early to make the call that in fact there is a problem. So when I have a 14, 15 year old patient who comes to me and says, my general dentist has suggested that we get these extracted, I will take a look at the film. If there is a true issue with, in terms of, you know, it's upside down or something like that, then yes, I can understand. But in the vast majority, there is no issue like that. It's a tooth like this where you should know that there's bone that's going to form. And remember, a tooth erupts in what? Three planes of space. Which are the three? And what's going to happen to the alveolar bone? It's going to fall. So it's a little early at this age to start making decisions. Hey, let's go ahead and extract the wisdom teeth. Any questions about that? Well, this is kind of a random question, but most people get their wisdom teeth out, so why is that? I mean, why does nature kind of send us teeth that don't fit? It makes no sense, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why are they there? You don't need them, they cause trouble, it doesn't fit. So you've actually touched on something I was going to touch on when we get into the manual, but I can tell you right now. So the question that came up was whether or not wisdom teeth are needed, should they be extracted, why did God give them to us if they don't even fit in? Um, wisdom teeth are pretty controversial. So if you ask 10 different clinicians, you're going to get 10 different opinions. 
I'll tell you what we know as far as the data goes, what we know about wisdom teeth. And I'll give you a couple of different viewpoints on it. The argument to take, now keep in mind, if there are true impactions, and that's not a decision that can be made early, that's typically a decision that is made after the age of 21, and I'm talking about a study, a group that was put together by the National Institutes of Health, and this was, if I'm not mistaken, in the 70s, they put together a group of experts to actually look into this issue of wisdom teeth being extracted. And they came out with a series of guidelines, and they talked about don't make the decision to extract wisdom teeth, or don't make the decision that a tooth is impacted, wisdom teeth, <coughs> till the age of 20. So from that standpoint, just so that you know, typically those decisions are made after the age of 20. The argument for removing wisdom teeth used to be, and I'm going back again to the 70s and maybe even mid 80s, late 80s, it was that as the wisdom teeth erupt, they're erupting mesially, as we talked about. They apply a force against the other teeth, and that then results in the lower front teeth getting crooked on a 21, 22 year old. That was what was believed. And actually work that was done in our institution here, in my department, by Dr. Buzz Behrens, who's now the editor of the American Journal of Orthodontics, clearly proved, along with other people who corroborated his work, that that's not necessarily correct. The remodeling of the lower jaw continues on. It is not something that stops, and that remodeling is what then causes the lower teeth to curl, whether people have wisdom teeth or didn't have them. Now, there's an opposing view to that, from Margaret Robinson from England, and she believes that actually there is adequate pressure. Now, there have been Shimstock studies, there have been various things that have done, and I think the consensus today is that wisdom teeth do not contribute to lower crowding as they erupt. Having said that, the argument still remains that wisdom teeth should be taken out early. And if you asked an oral surgeon, a colleague of mine, I'm sure he would tell you the advantages in his mind of taking them out they would be the following. Nerve regeneration is far better on a younger person. So taking them out would minimize paresthesia, potentially, that's one. Certainly the argument is made very commonly that the most posterior, most distal tooth is the hardest to keep clean. And therefore, they're the ones to get most likely carious, and extracting a carious third molar lends itself to fracture, complications, get them out before all that. So those are the arguments that I hear currently. But that amounts to, in my mind, prophylactic surgery. So you have to decide whether that's something that you know is beneficial to your patient or not. If you're a surgeon, and I know some of your parents are probably oral surgeons, prophylactic surgery, I think, should be considered cautiously. And 2013, I think in the Journal of Public Health, it came out that insurance companies had been billed over $1.2 billion in wisdom tooth removal and wisdom teeth being removed. So it, is, it has significant economic impact as well. I don't know, does that help? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about that? All right, so in summary, the maxillary complex is displaced downwards and forwards, as you're all well aware. It remodels posterior superiorly. That's where the opposition takes place. The, panel peri the palatal aspect of your periosteum is depository, versus the nasal lining is actually resorptive in nature. Keep in mind that as drift of the dentition takes place, there is an increase in alveolar vertical, buccal, and mesial placement of the teeth and the sutures can, in fact, be modified in the maxilla. If you buy, how many of you have set a denture so far with it? Have, have you gotten into prosthodontic lab yet? No. Not yet, okay. I apologize, this is actually the first time I've been given an opportunity to lecture the first year, so I didn't, I'm not, I didn't realize that you haven't. One of the first things you're gonna do in denture setups is does anybody know which tooth you place first it's always the maxillary central incisor. 
that's the most important tool in the face. So if you're, repair, if, you're, if you're placing a denture, you're going to start with the maxillary central incisor. If you're an orthodontist, no different. You've got to get that upper incisor in the right position. Then it's just putting everything around it. So if you believe that the most important tooth in the head is the maxillary incisor, then I think you've understood the importance of the growth and development and That's ultimate right. position of the maxilla. Thank you all very much. There's my email. Feel free to email me questions or whatever Dr. Hans had requested. I know, Nick, what did you say exactly he had requested? Something you learned. Something you learned. No. All right.